So it's it's really a pleasure to be here. I, you know, just in the you know less than 24 hours I've been here, I've already learned a ton just from everybody that's uh, that's in the room. Uh, there's really a uh, just a number of unique service providers and and people that bring a lot of experience, a lot of depth uh, to to the industry, and um, just you know by the side, I don't I don't have any uh, uh, cavities per se uh, like like Brad does, but. Uh, uh, is, isn't it perfect that, that the guy running NTLA, uh, you know, is an Eagle Scout that's raising money for the homeless? You know, I mean, talk about needing to put a, a you know a more positive face on, on the industry relative to what was uh, shared this morning in the in the villainization session. Uh, so, Brad, thanks for for who you are and what you're doing. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, I got into the tax lien uh, industry or tax lien business about six years ago, uh, but really just as, a, as an allocator, as somebody uh, investing there. Um, and since that time, we've kind of, uh, in successive years and successive quarters, uh, just added breadth and depth to uh, what we're doing in that space. So, you know, while uh, there's probably... 40 or 50 people here that, that can uh, provide you know, greater insight from a portfolio management strategy at the ground level of tax liens. Uh, what I wanted to do and hope to share with you is, was really share the allocator's perspective of, of uh, investing in tax liens and then share a little bit about where, where we're doing and, and where we're going uh, in terms of putting capital into the, into the space at this point. So, um, Advisors are searching for, for yield in a yield-starved world. You know, as I was preparing, I thought, you know, a more interesting way to, to say this was, why did I put my mom in tax liens? Um, and uh, I don't have to say that hypothetically. Uh, I don't have to say that as a, um, you know, uh, a, a what if, or as an advisor trying to gain uh, credibility by making false statements <laughs> about would you put your mother in this? Uh, and um, truly, uh, I mean, my mom is in tax liens. Um, uh, she's in our tax lien fund. So uh, we started allocating to that in 2010, as, as I'd mentioned. And um, of course, we've been through the cycles uh, of the yield you can capture, the yield that uh, um, you know, has, has disappeared on the front end uh, of, of that space. And uh, you know, the, it, it's really a, a you know a challenge because um, since we're one and a half sessions from uh, Johnny Cash and, and the other more interesting things, um, I want to give you a, a quick math exercise. All right, so uh, on the heels of Veterans Day yesterday, um, our our bank and others uh, are running Veterans Day specials, right, on certificates of deposit at the bank. And uh, in our particular instance, it's 1%. Wow, that was, that was for effect. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was very well timed. Uh, so take your current income and then figure out at 1% what is the capital required to replace your income. What's the number? I mean, I, I don't want anybody to necessarily share their share, share their income publicly, but so I'll do it for you. If you want to replace a hundred thousand dollars of income, what's it take at one percent? Who's the math genius? I heard it. I think ten ten million bucks at one percent. Okay. Now I'm I'm not the I'm not the youngest person in the room, but uh, I probably have farther from retirement than median here. Uh, you know, you divide that into, you know, I'd like to say 25 years from now, I, I wouldn't have to go to work every day. If I want to replace $100,000 of income, divide by 20 years, when the number is 10 million, how much do I have to save every year if my compounding rate is also 1%? Well, we'll make it easier. The compounding rate is zero. It's like four hundred thousand dollars a year, but I'm but I'm only making a hundred thousand. So how do you save 
$400,000 a year over 25 years to get to 10 million. And I mean, that's, that's kind of a synoptic of, of the challenge that advisors you know, across the country, across the, across the globe are facing in replacing the income needs that, that their people have. And it's not just for people in my mom's age bracket, right? I mean, I'm thinking about that 25 years from, from retirement away. So um, in the US, so this is just a quick snapshot. The 10-year treasury today is at 2.33%. So it doesn't take 10 million, it takes six. Uh, the aggregate bond index that Barclays published is about two and three quarters percent. So it doesn't take six million, it takes four and a half. Our, uh, our tax lien fund uh, currently is, is in the eight percent range. Uh, when uh, it's not just, just bonds, uh, but I'm going to circle back to that for a second. Uh, is Jeremy Grantham a familiar name to, to anybody in the room? Um, yeah, he was kind of famous because he was the luckiest guy on Wall Street uh, about 17 years ago. And I, and I say luckiest guy on Wall Street because nobody really believes that they can forecast anymore. Um, out of, uh, just as a, for instance, um, the, uh, the top 25 oil economists uh, in, in the world, um, anybody want to guess what the lowest price per barrel in, two, in 2015 was there. So in 2014, so it was a September survey, what was the lowest guesstimate of 2015 price per barrel? Anybody shout it out? 75, higher. It's 104. I mean, these are the top 25 smartest guys uh, in, the, in, the oil, in the oil industry. Uh, that are that are making economic forecasts on a on a price per barrel of oil basis, and the lowest of all twenty all twenty five of them twenty five of twenty five were over a hundred. The lowest of the twenty five had one hundred and three hundred and four dollars a barrel uh, in in his forecast. So, I don't think forecast is is a uh, is a highly reliable uh, thing to trade on or or invest on, but in the case of Jeremy Grantham, in nineteen ninety eight. He actually predicted to the point where the uh, S and P would close 2008 at the, the best 10-year forecast. You know, Forbes did a big thing about it. Um, in 2001, he actually uh, ranked these 10 asset classes from what would be the top performing asset class to the least performing asset class over the over the following 10-year period. So from 2001 to 2011, what's going to be the best performing asset class? In last place, well, any guesses? What, what was last place? You, you can talk to me even though it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> Bonds. Bonds. It's a good guess. He's a stock manager, and he, he had stocks at last. Um, he was... Uh, the only thing he didn't get right, he had one through ten ranked in stack rank order, and if he had swapped number three and number four, it would have been perfect, 100%. So, so the business of forecasting, as uh, indicated by the oil analogy, is, is tough business uh, and not something that we would use to invest on or, or trade on. At the same time, some people are better than others, and you know he hit it right in 2008. He nailed it in 2001, and this is September 30th, 2015, looking forward, and he uses real, so real return, for those of you that aren't as dorky as I am, is just uh, uh, the return plus whatever inflation is, or subtract inflation out of these numbers. So he's showing U.S. large cap, and this is a seven-year asset class real return forecast. He's showing minus 0.6%. That's his forecast for, for where stocks are going to go. Uh, U.S. small cap, zero. Uh, U.S. cash, minus 0.4%. So you're, you're zero minus your inflation. International bonds, minus 3%. U.S. bonds, minus 1.1%. So on and so forth. So, um, you know, in my view, uh, one of the more reliable forecasters in a 
uh, in a business that's just tough, you know, isn't expecting a lot of great things for uh, kind of the broader global macroeconomic uh, asset class. Does he have a touch on real estate? Do you um, he doesn't issue forecasts on it. Uh, it was in his top 10 uh, from, a, from a forecasting standpoint in 2001. Um, but these he actually updates every month. You can just go to gmo.com. Uh, if you can get past all the genetically modified foods links, uh, you, you'll find his, <laughs> his firm. All right, so back, back to bonds just for a second. You know, to, to capture uh, 8%, you got to go to Greece. Who's, who's long on Greece? <laughs> that means you probably should be. <laughs> right? You're, you're probably right. It, it, it just takes a, it takes a contrary mindset and a lot of guts. <laughs> no leverage, just a straight up putting cash. Right. Thank you for talking. It's, it's good to. Maybe the, maybe the podium's too high. It's too, eight feet taller than all of you. Uh, you remember the pigs? Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Ireland Greece, Spain. So three years ago, uh, the pigs countries were like imminent default, imminent bankruptcy. The highest pig, well, other than Greece, uh, is at two and three quarters percent. That's Portugal. So Spain, Italy, and, and Ireland are all sub 2%. And, and this is on the heels of two or three years ago, um, you know, yields in the 8, 9, 10% that were reflective of, of sovereign defaults uh, as, as Europe faced the, uh, their, their own iteration of the global financial crisis. Um, my, uh, my beloved wife's country is, is here uh, in, in Australia. Speaking of forecasts, the, the best forecast I ever made was um, about the time Jeremy Grantham made his. Um, I, my first internship was, uh, was a, or first job was an internship in Sydney, Australia. And we're really driving around uh, downtown in the central business district going, are there really CDs that pay 9%? I mean, this is, this is wild. You know, you see, ANZ, ANZ, as they say down under, uh, ANZ Bank, you know, certificate of deposit, one year, 9%. Man, that is phenomenal yield. So, um, so, so I brought this trade idea back to my investment committee. Like, Australia, you know, developed country, uh, mature banking system, we can get 9% on certificates of deposit. Called uh, Goldman Sachs, they were willing to hedge the hedge the currency risk for us, and um, we uh, we had started these things called economic forums in our, in our own backyard, where we'd bring in just thought leaders of thought leaders. So we had uh, Fed Governor uh, Wayne Angel that was that was speaking, doing a doing a client meeting for us, and, and this guy is is so smart. When Bank of Japan wants to figure out what they're going to do with monetary policy, you know, he's somebody that they call. He was actually a voting governor under uh, Volcker and Greenspan. It's a really smart interest rate guy, right? And so I brought it back and, and we had him as a guest in our investment committee that week and, and this was the week where I was making this recommendation. I'm like, it's Australia, developed market, it's 9% and we can swap the currency risk. And he said, don't think it's a good idea. So we, we passed on that one. We uh, did not make, uh, we did not execute on that trade. Uh, believe in the in the value of advice, but uh, sometimes you, you need to you need to go with your gut. Um, just a, a hair more on the on the global uh, kind of yield landscape. Um, you know, I talked about Japan briefly. You, you can loan the Japanese government money for ten years at thirty basis points. And if you think that's a deal, you contrast that with Switzerland. And it's negative 32 basis points. So you're, you're guaranteed to lose money over a 10-year period. This is, uh, this is right off of Bloomberg uh, yesterday, actually. So you can 
buy a $103,000 uh, Swiss 10-year bond today, and it will mature at $100,000. They're guaranteed to lose $3,000 over the next 10 years. Uh, $100,000 investment in Switzerland. Germany isn't a whole lot better. You, you, you can loan their government money for five years at negative nine basis points. It, and if that isn't enough to sort of talk you know, the average client off the ledge of traditional fixed income as, as a source of income, uh, as soon as interest rates go up, uh, many traditional fixed income classes are, are, are going to get rocked. Um, duration is a factor. If you're buying 30-year treasuries, you know, interest rates go from 30-year treasury today is at 3.2. 30-year treasuries go to 4.2. Your principal value drops 18%. You can see the... the the other various things. So, um, you know, it, it's one thing to take, um, you, you know, to, to not be able to replace uh, income in retirement. It, it's another one when, when the traditional asset class that has dominated income focused portfolios for at least the last 30 years, if not forever, um, you know, is, is just facing challenges that, it's, that, are, that are substantial. This is a, a New York Times headline from, from two years ago. Uh, just illustrate the, some of the, the risks in traditional asset classes. Um, it says, bond market plunge baffles the experts. And I'm not sure, um, maybe that's like the, uh, the Washington Post article about the 134, you know, the senior that lost his home over $134 in back taxes. And uh, when in actuality, there were 14 court cases behind it. Appreciate the, the color on that. Because um, it's not baffling at all. I, I mean, I've shown this slide in about every client meeting I've done in the last seven years. Sooner, sooner or later, <laughs> interest rates are going to go up. And we'll be right about that. Um, so uh, it, it doesn't even necessarily take interest rates, in fact, going up. All it necessarily takes is the threat of interest rates going up to just see traditional fixed income just get clobbered. So May of 2013, if you follow Fed policy and you follow uh, what's happening in interest rates, uh, you remember it well. Ben Bernanke says, it's probably about time we start to raise interest rates. One of his speeches. Beige book gets released, press publishes it, bond market overnight drops substantially. Your treasury bonds lost an average of 6.8%. You know, and these are the, uh, the ones that uh, Harry Markowitz uh, it calls the risk-free bonds, you know, the trip, AAA rated treasuries, uh, the risk-free bonds at, at uh, having lost an average of 6.8% in a month. Um, you know, to, to add a little fuel to the fire, uh, the, with the Veterans Day special 1% I talked about, Rule of 72 means you, know, you, you divide your rate into 72, and that's how long it takes you to double your money. Right? So if you're 60 years old today, and you put it in a CD, and you, and you, you take the Veterans Day special, you, you're not only guaranteed your money back, you're guaranteed to be dead by the time your money doubles. You know, you're going to be 100, and, maybe you beat the odds, and you live to 132 years old. But... Uh, I would take my chances elsewhere. <clears throat> so when we're talking, uh, you know, our view of allocating within the tax lien space, um, I, you know, hopefully nobody's on their uh, Scott Trade account buying, uh, uh, you know, Vanguard uh, corporate bond ETF right now. Um, we really believe we can capture better risk-adjusted risk adjusted yields in the tax lien marketplace than competing instruments. Right, so uh, we were talking last night uh, over, over cocktails about, you know, it, it just isn't what it used to be on the primary yield front, you know, first year auction. And we need, uh, you know, our senior lenders to, to drop rates and, and whatnot. And, and all, that's, all that's true, all, all that's fair. But the, the opportunity in the tax lien space compared to other income-producing instruments 
you know, we're talking about the, the good old days when we were getting double digit returns with tax lien, you know, safety and, and asset backed uh, yields. Um, you know, we're, um, we're in a place where we're still able to do a, a, a lever, you know, it takes leverage to get there, but a levered return of eight, which takes that retiree, you know, nine years to double their money at 8%, not 72 years. And kind of on the point in the tax lien space of it not being what it used to be, I, I kind of look at that and I go, well, good, good. That's at this point in the economic cycle, right, what's it supposed to be? You know, uh, in 2009, 2010, when foreclosures are, are spiking and non-performing rates on mortgages are, are up, and the stock market's down 47%, and unemployment's nine, and GDP go, turns negative for four quarters, that is exactly when you want your tax liens to deliver the yield. And they do, right? That's exactly the, the stage in the economic cycle where they're doing what, what they're in the portfolio to do. You know, you look at today, if you believe it, 5.1 unemployment, um, but stock market at record highs, uh, S&P 500 corporate earnings at record highs, uh, GDP growing at 2.5%, um, inflation low. I, I mean, it, nobody's um, you know, ultra bullish on, on what's happening in the U.S. economy, but things just aren't that bad. You know, I mean, it's, it's been six years since we've had a contraction in GDP. I mean, six years. So at this stage in the economic cycle, we're not really looking for tax liens for growth. And if we have to endure lower yields while the stock market reaches record highs, that's fine because other parts of our portfolio are carrying the weight. Where we really want tax liens to, to carry the day for us is when there's a lot more supply um, and we can, we, we can capture those yields uh, and, it, and in that environment, having a price stable, you know, coupon producing investment that isn't correlated to the rest of the economy is, is what we need. It's exactly what we want. And if we, go, if we go at this stage with interest rates where they are into, um, you know, kind of the next uh, great recession, the next hundred year flood in the credit markets, you know, how much can bonds really do for you? I mean, if, if you're at two and interest rates drop to one, uh, you know, you'll get a little bit of pickup in price. But in our view, in our practice, what, what we're looking for is over a, over a cyclical period, over a full economic cycle, which might be seven years or 10 years or five years, that we're, we're going to lean into uh, tax liens in the economic cycle where everything else is falling apart. And that's exactly the kind of time where, uh, where liens can produce what, uh, what a lot of us in the room know that they can. I kind of talked about this, but you know, tax lien price performance won't demonstrate volatility tied directly to global yield and Fed policy. Right? I mean, how, how many people's tax lien portfolio dropped 7% in May of 2013 for you allocators or fund managers? You know, I mean, it, yes, it, it impact. you know, what senior lenders charge, uh, the relative value, I mean, it, it's not that their price, uh, it's not that they're 100% price insensitive, but they're not, uh, you know, the, the correlation to Fed policy, the correlation to global interest rates, I mean, when Greece was at 16%, and now that they're at 8 how much did that show up in your tax lien valuations? It doesn't. So, um, you know, from, from our view, uh, the, the, the point in the economic cycle where it carries the day is, is when everything else is, is falling apart. And based on the economic cycle, we are, we're, based on where we are now in the economic cycle, with interest rates as low as they are, if we fall into, into recession, there's nothing you can do to, uh, to have something that will, will uh, go up in value. Being able to capture 7, 8, 10% uh, 
in tax liens when everything else is minus 10, minus 15, minus 20 is what we're, what we're wanting to do. Um, tax lien managers can provide asset coverage unavailable in other asset classes. Um, you know, I, I look at things like the, the, the Vanguard you know, mortgage-backed securities ETF. You know, and, and for those of you that play in the MBS world, you know that uh, the yields aren't what Vanguard is paying. <laughs> there, there's costs, there's expense uh, between kind of the coupon at the mortgage-backed securities world and then what coupon is able to be delivered to clients that are actually investing in the mortgage-backed securities ETF. And, you know, within the MBS space, you, you can capture 1.5% today. And, um, you know, on a, on a net to the client basis. And your loan to value is nowhere close what you can get in the, in the lien space. Right? I mean, you're, um, you're talking 85, 90, 95% uh, within the mortgage-backed securities world and you know, 10, 15, 20 percent, you know, lean to value in the in the tax lien space. And then, um, you know, as uh, as as Tom, you know, has success in the secondary market, uh, as securitizations, uh, you know, happen more and more, um, you know, some of the yield premium may may disappear, kind of as that asset class gets democratized as access gets easier. But today, th there is still so much complexity and so much inefficiency in allocating the asset class that uh, there is what we call in the investment management business a, a, a substantial inefficient market premium that we can capture on, on tax liens. And what our, and this is one of the things our clients are looking to us to do for. So, um, it's kind of a, a, a quick snapshot of, uh, you know, as allocators within the, the tax lien world, uh, things that are driving us to allocate more. Um, the um, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, released a study about six months ago that just talked about kind of in, in summary, summary form, uh, where is this whole alternative investment industry going? You know, just broadly, of which tax liens is one vertical. And their forecast was that $5.7 trillion in the next five years would go into the alternative asset class. $5.7 trillion. What are some other alternative assets? Yeah, so um, how that gets defined, I, I think, is... Uh, to some extent, that's the, the, the beauty or the unbeauty is in the eye of the beholder. Um, what's traditionally lumped into alternative is uh, REITs, hedge funds, um, private credit, uh, specialty finance, um, timber. Um, you know, if you, if you pull up uh, kind of, you know, Yale's annual report, um, all the stuff there. So... You know, our, uh, what we're doing in the marketplace is, uh, like Stephen said in the introduction, we're, we're providing access to REAs, family offices, and, and trust companies that are just looking for something other than, you know, negative 32 basis points in Swiss government debt, right? They're looking for something other than 220 on a 10-year treasury, um, you know, without any fees. So uh, our approach is that we combine senior secured lending with opportunistic investing uh, to deliver really kind of unique products to the marketplace. Uh, tax liens is, is a piece of that. Um, it's less than 10% of our, our book, but uh, between five and 10. So within the tax lien space specifically, I mean, we're a capital partner to uh, tax lien management servicing and acquisition companies. Um, we're a strategic partner, you know, we, uh, unlike maybe traditional allocators, uh, we're not looking to just sort of place a trade and be, be done. I mean, we, we like assets with a kind of complexity where we're sitting on the investment committee, we're helping make portfolio decisions, we're helping negotiate terms with senior lenders, uh, those kind of things. And then we're a capital and strategic partner to real estate, um, the real estate that comes out of the tax lien. Uh, in, in certain geographic areas. 
So uh, over the last seven years, we, we've been kind of everywhere in the capital stack uh, within the tax lien structure. We've been in equity. Uh, we did a sub debt uh, deal that was um, uh, kind of the layers were you know cap one senior or sub debt, and then had a, a lot of equity behind us. Um, with yield compression, those sub debt deals are, are a lot harder to do. But um, we're still, you know, kind of aggressively looking to grow balance sheet within the within the real estate space, and, and that's where I wanted to focus a, a percentage of my time today. Um, so we're, um, you know, the, the the real estate that comes out of the tax lien process is is not um, often commercially bankable through through traditional lines, right? I mean, you heard the story earlier today of something that, uh, um, you know, the, uh, they took some percentage of their, their portfolio of liens to deed. Um, that falls off the borrowing base for uh, the line of credit. And absent the ability to turn around and sell that immediately uh, to, to another investor, you know, you've, you've, got, a, you've got an issue there. Um, We've got uh, the ability to, to finance the real estate side of that transaction. So um, we, we typically look at uh, what's the end game? What, what are you wanting to do with the property? And that, that it's usually some cocktail of the three. You know, and, and unless your, uh, uh, your fund has specific requirements like you have to sell the real estate, you know, <coughs> immediately or there's a there's a sliver in your portfolio where, where you're able to hold it for a period of time absent some of the you know investment policy statement type type things that uh, you might have in pri private placements or prospectus type documents um, we often see sort of a, a combination and you know this is not at all this is not a term sheet <laughs> um, but the, the way we look at it is if there are properties in your portfolio that have come through the tax lien space, uh, that the highest and best use is to is to retail it, is to, to find a, a retail investor that's going to pay something close to uh, you know fair market value. Uh, we'll go up to sixty five percent you know loan to value on that. On the wholesale side, um, you know you're just trying to sell it to an investor uh, that, that's going to put the bulk of the capital in there, but you need to do whatever needs to be done to even get it ready to wholesale. Uh, we're, we're closer to 40%. Uh, the rentals, and it really depends on what's happening in the rental submarket. And you know, our, our due diligence will lead that number to go up or down based on uh, vacancy, supply, demand, and, and those kind of things. But on average, um, the you know, capital to acquire and then rent it out will we'll fund it around 50% loan to value. In instances that can go up to seventy-five, if if it's a strong submarket with uh, with good kind of uh, you know, rental demographics in, in the underlying submarket. So, um, to protect the innocent or guilty, whatever, um, this is uh, rounded to the closest thousand, uh, a deal literally out of the deck that we just did in July. So uh, we had 50 properties. Uh, they were, there was a cumulatively a million dollars in it at that point that had been spent on taxes and subtaxes and legals to get it to the point where it was at deed. So about $20,000 a property. Uh, they wanted a million five. And uh, within this 50, there was a kind of a blend of uh, wholesale, rent, and retail. Uh, there wasn't an outside directive that said it had to be one or the other. Um, our collective analysis said that uh, by the time that million five was added to the million, so two and a half million, uh, the after repair value, once that capital was spent in the highest and best you know, ROI use, that there was after repair value of $4 million. So, you got carry cost, you got taxes, you got insurance, you got our debt service, which is not at rates that Cap One will provide. Um, but you know the, the, the gain on sale uh, in, in that 
uh, particular environment was uh, was a million five. It's a big gross margin. On the um, oh, excuse me. Um, on the rental side, um, take the same fifty properties. You've got a million dollars spent on it. The, re the rehab budget that we're going to approve is going to be lower than some combination of retail and, and rent. Um, but you can put a million dollars in, into those properties, have an after repair value of, of $3 million. In this particular instance, and this was straight off the, uh, uh, the pro forma on this deal, there was monthly rent that was right around $50,000. $50, right? So if you've spent a million and you're paying debt service on a million dollars at you know higher than commercial rates, but then you got fifty thousand dollars a month of cash flow coming off of that. You know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist or Jeremy Grantham to figure out that that works. So, um, you know, we'll look at the uh, in that particular deal uh, the, the rental kind of yield on a net operating income basis uh, was forty five. So. Within that REO bucket, you know, we're, 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 um, we like that deal. We, we like that space. That's something somewhere we're increasing our profile. Um, there's a second microphone. Um, any questions so far? Who's ready for the bar in the meeting? <laughs> All of us. Um, well, um, relative to the to the comments on the uh, uh, this this is more for fun, but rel relative to the, the the comments on the on the I, you know I saw villainization. I think it was previous. Was it called demonization and then it got changed to villainization? Is that right, Stephen? Okay. So I did read the agenda. Um, so um, I just wanted to show a, 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 a quick thing. I, I, I really believe we're in an industry that, that can be a catalyst for positive change in the communities that, that we work in, uh, I mean, especially when you end up you know, owning 500 properties in a community uh, or 1,000 properties, um, which we, we do in certain communities. And so uh, as it turns out, our um, I was I think in high school, something like a spring break trip, and we and we visited this this random uh, faith-based organization in uh, in Baltimore, and it was struck by just you know how they serve the poor and and you know how they had a heart for their community and, and those kind of things. And our first giant block of REO, shockingly, was in Baltimore. Um, you know, and, and given the news and whatnot, uh, that's, there's a highly inefficient market, <laughs> very inefficient market in Baltimore. You know, you got properties that were developed by the uh, uh, king somebody, uh, and you still have to pr pay uh, ground rents uh, to the king. This shows up in title in Baltimore. Anybody doing stuff in Baltimore? If this was... Uh, uh, trial by fire or whatever, whatever you want to call it. We're getting into this going, okay, how do we underwrite this into the model? <laughs> We're paying $30 a year to uh, you know, the, the, the ground rents to the king. Um, and he can come after us. I don't know how. but um, So uh, when our first 100 properties or so uh, were in Baltimore, uh, this was few, uh, in 2010, I decided, well, I wonder if that faith-based group I went to like 20 years still even exists. And uh, so I called them to say, hey, look, I haven't, <laughs> you don't know me, I don't know you, but we're now giant landlords in your town. And uh, if you're still doing community stuff, uh, I'd love to hang out and, and find out what you're doing. So as it turned out, uh, they, were, they had uh, started a, uh, an NGO called Adopt-A-Block, 
And what they do is they will put, they'll kind of do street fairs. And they'll have uh, people that represent community services from job placement to you know, resume building to um, uh, a whole bunch of uh, everything. So um, as it happens when you end up in, in REO, there were, there were certain clusters of, uh, of communities where we're like, well, I'm pretty sure we don't want this real estate. So um, we raised some money. Uh, so real, real capital, um, and then donated uh, a couple of the deeds to this to this nonprofit. And what the nonprofit did is every single year they will take a home in the community. They'll they'll raise money from us and, and others. Uh, they'll they'll kind of do a Habitat for Humanity style renovation, and then they'll they'll put a community ambassador in that property for free like Habitat does, but their sole purpose, their sole job is make this community a better place to, to live. Uh, that's, that's the cost of sort of the, the free house that might have cost us all in $15,000. So uh, they go and, and adopt it. We'll run street fairs kind of on, on the same street. And, you know, it's sure it's... Uh, uh, charitable, but it's not quite utopian, right? Because when we put, when we partner with groups like Adopt a Block, and we put a uh, community champion on that block, what happens? You know, all all the boats all the all the boats rise in that high tide. You know, property values go up, rents go up because it's a safer and, and it's a better place to live. So. Um, you know, somebody raised a question this morning. Um, I think it might have been Bob about what are we doing on the on the positive side, and uh, you know, from a PR standpoint. Well, um, in this particular community in Baltimore, Fox News actually picked up the story. Now they don't give any credit to the tax lien industry. Uh, I will throw that out there, but uh, in fact, it was the tax lien industry. That, uh, that made this possible. The war on crime is being fought on many fronts, and today one Baltimore organization tried to fight crime with a party. Miranda Stevens shows us how they're attempting to take back the streets one block at a time. The music was so powerful on East Chase Street, it brought residents out of their homes. Quite frankly, that's the point. If you change the people, you change the city. It's called Adopt-A-Block, an organization that puts on block parties in neighborhoods throughout the city, providing everything from free food to free clothing. Most of them are surprised. You know, they're looking forward and saying, is this for free? I'm like, sure. Yeah, we just want to be a blessing. The hope is to build the community up and cut down crime. We understand that uh, the political system can't do everything. Actually, it's going to require the people getting involved. Adopt a Block has been putting on block parties since 1991, but organizers say events like this are needed now more than ever. It's easy to get discouraged when you see negative reports and see crime rising, but we know we, we go in week after week and we see lives change and we see people go through all the different resources that we have here, and it makes a difference in their life. It's an effort much appreciated by residents like Barbara Parham. I just think it's wonderful, beautiful. Who on any other day might be too afraid to go outside. We're in a neighborhood that's, you know, it's crime ridden and, and uh, but it's very pleasant out here today. Very, very pleasant. In East Baltimore, Miranda Stevens, Fox 45 News at 10. Adopt a block host parties every summer from June to September. Um, so, you know, what if as as an, as an industry you you embraced sort of a, a you know the the kind of change on a positive note that that can come out of the real estate as as contrast to the villainization or demonization. Um, if you want to give credit, probably where credits due. Um, the you know. What if we, as as an industry, kind of kind of looked at 
uh, you know, the, the kind of things that we can do when we end up with the deed to, to the property. Um, you, you know, depending on your worldview, you, you can call it, uh, um, you know, chance or, or happenstance. Uh, about the, uh, the the spring break visit in in high school and the first you know hundred properties we end up with in in Baltimore being in the same uh, in the same spot. But um, um, anyway, that that's that's our view. We're, we're hoping through through the REO side to to make a profit, but at the same time we're uh, when when we can be a part of community transformation in a positive way. Uh, it's great for the community. It's great for the industry, and it's great for returns for us. If there aren't other uh, questions, I'm done. Thanks.